What's magnificent about the story isn't just what God did, but it's that God led them. I don't know if you know this, but if you read the story in Exodus 14, if you got your Bibles open, in the very beginning, go to the next verse, please. In the very beginning, Moses actually was being led by God down to the Red Sea. But in Exodus 14, 1, it says this. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near Pir Pihitharoth between Migdal and the sea. They are to encamp by the sea directly opposite of Baal Zephon. Pharaoh will think the Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. Now, I don't know if you caught it, but it almost seems like God's GPS is broken. It seems like, Lord, what are you doing here? What do you mean turn back? You just led us out of Egypt. You just led us away from Pharaoh. Why would we turn back and camp here? By the way, it was a longer destination that God was bringing them to a different direction. The shortest path would have only taken them a couple days. Right out of Egypt along the coast. In fact, I got a map up here if you can put up the map. And you can see it. They're over here in the left-hand corner here in Egypt. And all they had to do to get to the promised land to where God would take them is right out along the Mediterranean Sea. They just had to curve around. It would have been the shortest route for them to take. But God tells them to turn back. God tells them to camp way down south. Instead of going farther east, he tells them to go south. That doesn't make sense, God. It seems like your GPS is broken. Now, I don't know about you, but have you ever gotten a fight with your spouse about how to get to a destination? We each have different ways of taking turns, right? The way that we travel. And I would have thought that Moses would have been like, wait a minute, Lord. What are you doing here? But you see, God has a plan. What's God's plan? Why on earth would God set them up for a trap? And he tells us in here, he says, I am the one that's going to harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them. You see, it was all in God's plan. God is sovereign. He is in control. He knows all things. And he says, I'm going to set it up where the people think that they're in a trap, where the people have to come to the end of themselves for the people to think and know that Pharaoh is going to pursue them. But don't you worry. I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them, but I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. You see, it was all in God's plan. He's the one. It's like when the Holy Spirit led Jesus out into the desert to be tempted by Satan, the Holy Spirit is the one doing the leading. Sometimes we think in our walk with God or our walk with faith, it's like, why, God, are you allowing this to happen? Why, God, are you letting this happen to me? Why, God, are you putting me through these trials and these tribulations? And we question this and we question that. But the truth is that sometimes God will bring you to a place where you have to come to the end of yourself. You see, and the Israelites looked to Moses and they actually say to him, they say, Moses, why did you bring us out here to die? Moses, why would you do this to us? You see, they didn't know God's plan. And they're questioning Moses. They said, wouldn't it have been better for you to leave us back in Egypt? Wouldn't it have been better back there? It's amazing that the Israelites would rather stay in what they know, even though it's slavery, even though it's death, even though it's hardship, and God has a better plan for them, but they would rather stay in what they know because it's more comfortable than to experience the unknown that God has for them. I, I don't think you're getting it yet this morning. 
I'm talking to the people that continue to stay inside the places that they know that are comfortable for them, the relationships that are broken, the relationships and the jobs that don't work, the family functions where they continue to react the way they react because they don't know the uncomfortable. They don't want to experience, but maybe the thing that God wants you to experience is better than what you ever known. Maybe the thing that God wants you to experience is better, but you'd rather stay here than go over here with God and trust in him because this is what you know, so it's comfortable for you. You see, the Source Church started. TSC started because God had stripped away some of the things that were comfortable. God had stripped away for us some of the things that we wanted to hold on to, financial security if you heard it in the video. Or our kids and our family and our schools and our comfortable life and the things that we like to do. Oh, we took them to baseball practice and we had our routines. Or the church and the growth that we were experiencing. Or even my 16-year-old daughter that I left behind in Michigan. There were some things that were comfortable in our lives, our patterns, our routines. And it wasn't until God said that there's something greater, there's a greater purpose, there's a greater mission, there's something better over here. And we didn't even realize what was the things that were holding us back. And this is what I want you to understand, that sometimes God will bring you to where you do not want to go. If you're taking notes, you should write this down. It's a paragraph that I came up with. You can tweet it, it's fine. But the, is, the, the, God will take you to where you do not want to go. To reveal what you don't even know. Okay, we got it up there on the screen. You can put it up there for them. To reveal what you don't even know. To free you from the things that are holding you back. You'll find it in a second through all the verses. I'm skipping around on them this morning. God wants to take you to a place that you don't even know, that you don't want to go to. Sometimes in your life, he's going to take you to places that it's at the end of your rope. It's not until you get to that barrier and you're like, I can't cross this myself. I can't do this myself. He will lead you to where you don't want to go to reveal to you, reveal inside of you the things you do not know that were there to free you from the things that you did not know you were in bondage to and show you a way that you never even knew was possible. I don't know if you caught all that, but sometimes he's going to lead you to a destination and you're like, God, how did I end up here? Why am I here? Sometimes we say that's rock bottom because the only way when you hit rock bottom is up. Sometimes when you hit rock bottom, the only place you can look up is up. You can only look up and you got to look toward God and he'll take you down to the pit in order for you to look up toward him. This is what the Israelites were. They were before The Red Sea, which they could not cross, and behind them was Pharaoh's army, and all they could do was look up. And that's when God responds. That's when God answers the call. That's where God comes through. He will lead you to places that you do not want to go. Anybody who's had a problem in their life or a situation at this can say amen. It's a place that you don't want to be at. And he'll let you go there in order for you to look up toward him. Because he'll reveal things inside of you that you were not even aware that were there. I'm telling you, when we came down here to plant the church, my wife and I thought we were going to get divorced. Because we started doing this. We started conflicting. And I'm like, God, this doesn't make sense. We're here planting your church. If we're planting your church, then our marriage should be thriving. It was going good in Michigan. Why is it suffering down here? And what God was doing, he was stirring up some things inside of us that we didn't even realize that were there. Because anytime God puts you through the pressure cooker, he puts you through the crock pot, and he puts you through a slow cook, guess what? He turns up the fire a little bit, and some some things start boiling to the surface. The impurities start boiling to the surface. And some of the things that we had stuffed down that we weren't even aware that were there, God had started putting the pressure on a little bit of our marriage and things started boiling to the surface and we had to work, work through some of those issues. The Israelites had a mindset that they would rather be slaves in Egypt than experience the promises that God had for them. 
They would rather stay comfortable in what they knew and to experience something that glorified him. Oh man, I wish I could preach to the teenage girl who's stuck in a relationship right now that she knows that is not good for her and she needs freedom because there's something better on the other side. I wish I could preach to the young man right now who's continuing to run with the wrong crowd, who's continuing to go to the substances, who's continuing to use things that he knows he shouldn't, and God has something planned for him on the other side, but he continues to stay comfortable in where he's at, even though it's not good for him. The Israelites had to break their mindset to learn to trust in the Lord. They had to break their mindset of slavery in order to become slaves to Christ. They had to break their bondage from Pharaoh in order to be chained to Christ. He led them to places that they did not want to go to, to reveal to things inside of them that they did not know that were there, to free them from things that they did not know that they were bondage to, to show them something that they had never seen before. And God parted the waters and they walked through on the other side. Now, this isn't the only story where God parted the waters. I want to fast forward a little bit to the book of Joshua. And here the Israelites are at the Jordan River. And you would think that they've learned that God can part all things. And they end up turning back and being fearful of the people in the land and for 40 years they wander the desert and that generation dies off and now here's a new generation it's a new time it's a new thing and they're before the Jordan River again and they're remembering what God had done to their ancestors in the past they're remembering the Red Sea and here it says in Joshua 1 Joshua is right after Deuteronomy. Joshua 3, verse 1. And here's what it says. It says, Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan. Now, I didn't make that word up, okay? That's in there. Where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priest carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you have never seen this before. But keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits between you and the Ark. Do not get near it. Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. He's telling them to get ready. He's telling them for three days, go and wash, get ready, get prepared. The same get ready, get prepared that we hear from Jesus in Matthew 25, that he's coming back again and we're to be ready and we're to be prepared at all times as believers. He's saying, get ready because God's going to do something great. By the way, they went and got ready after three days. I wonder if that's symbolic somewhere in the Bible. The three days. Maybe the three days when Jesus was in the tomb. Three days where Jesus had died and resurrected from the dead. You see, Jesus died on the cross for our sins and was in the tomb for three days because God was going to do something on Easter that was amazing, that would blow people's minds. God says, get ready because I'm going to do something. And Joshua was telling the people to get ready. And then as they get ready, he says, consecrate yourselves. Joshua said to the priest, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass ahead of the people. By the way, the Ark of the Covenant is where God dwelt. It's where his presence was. So let God go before us. Let God lead us. Put God out in front with the priests so the people can follow. We should be following after Jesus. And then it says... And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all the Israelites. Verse 7. So they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant when they reach the end of the Jordan's waters and go and stand in the river. What do you mean stand in the river? It's at flood stage. Now normally you could cross the Jordan and it's like 
six or seven feet deep. But at flood stage, there's places that are 40 feet deep. So that means you're crossing over and the waters are flooding down and instantly you can drop off. You've ever been in a lake where you've walked out and suddenly there's a drop off and you're gone? And the waters would just take them out. And so for the people to do this, there's an extreme amount of faith. There's a faith that God's going to show up. There's an expectation. Put the Ark of the Covenant in front with the priest and step out in the water. Just step out. Have faith that God's going to do something. Expect the unexpected. Believe in the impossible. That's what he says. And here's the story. Joshua said to the Israelites in verse 9, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you and that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Gereshazites, Amorites, Jebusites. See, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. As soon as the priests who carry the Ark of the Lord and the Lord of all the earth set foot on the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan, while the water flowing down of the Sea of the Arabeth was completely cut off. God did it again. Not just once. Not just twice. Four different times in Scripture, God cut off the waters for the people to walk through on dry ground. He did it for Moses. He did it for Joshua. And he did it for Elijah. God did it again. And that's what we're praying for in this series, that God will do it again. Sometimes he's going to take you to a place you don't want to go and reveal something in you that you don't even know about yourself. And he's going to let it boil up to the surface to free you from what you don't even realize that you're bondage to because he has something better for you that you don't even know what's there for you in the future. It's so good. You can taste it. I can see it on your faces. You want it. But you got to go through the Red Sea. You got to trust in the Lord. And so here's my challenge for you. Because some of you, some of you right now are up against a wall. And you have fears. I'm going to ask for the worship team to come back up here on stage, by the way, as we close down. Because some of you have fears, and God's taking you to that place of fear in order to strip away those fears to show you that you can trust in him. It's not trusting in yourself. He's the one that parted the waters. He's the one that opened up the dry ground. He's the one, and all the people had to do was walk through You see, all they had to do was respond. To respond to his graciousness, to respond to his grace, to respond to his invitation. He opened it up like a door and said, walk on through. Do you trust in me? And the reason it worked for them and it did not work for the Egyptians is because they put their trust in the Lord. Well, the Egyptians put their trust in themselves and in their weapons and in their chariots and in their horses. Do you put your trust in your material possessions to save you? Do you put your trust in your bank account? Do you put your trust in your credit card? Or do you put your trust in the Lord? Because he might be taking you to a place where you're hitting that wall right now in order for you to look up. He needed to break them from a pattern of fear, a pattern of oppression, a pattern to be prisoners to themselves in Egypt, to trust in him, to be led to the place that he wanted to take them that was better things than they could ever imagine. Do you put your trust in him? As he went before you, Jesus Christ went to hell to pay the price that you could not pay. Jesus Christ went and paid Satan death in order for you to receive his righteousness. He has opened the door. He has opened a way. All you do is have to respond. He's already done the work. Here's the wonderful thing. At the, at the end of the time where they'd crossed on dry ground. It amazes me if you look in the story 
that they began to sing. This is where it'd be good if we had a song or two, you know? Just, just so you guys can catch on a little bit. We're working together. They're coming. I'm teasing them. They know I love them. At the very end where they crossed through on dry ground, not only did they begin to sing, it says they began to sing Miriam's song, but if you catch it, they began to play with tambourines and with harps. Now I think about this, I'm like, they, they had tambourines. They can only pack what they can carry. So think about in your house, if you had to pack your house to carry your possessions, what is it that you would pack? Why is it that they would have a tambourine? Why is it that that was so important to them that they would pack a tambourine out of all of their possessions that they had? That's not something I would normally pack. But for them, it's like they had this expectation that we're going out to where God is leading us and we need to be able to praise and we need to be able to worship him. They had this expectation that God was going to do something when they were packing up. And as they traveled through the dry ground, they got to the other side. They begin to sing Miriam's song. And there's this chanting and explosion of music because they're so excited what God had done for them. And the thing is, when we celebrate what God has done in the past through his scriptures and through his stories, it gives us hope for a future. It gives us hope that God's going to do something again. Not just that, but here in the story of Joshua, he gives them this weird commandment, this weird instruction. And what he tells them is, I want you to go pick out the 12 tribes of Israel as a representative of all the people. So get a leader from each tribe. And I want you to go find a stone. Go pick a stone up from the riverbed. And I want you to take that stone and I want you to build an altar with it, he says. I want you to build an altar with these 12 stones. Well, that's a, that's a weird request, Lord. Why would you be telling Joshua to pick up 12 stones with the 12 tribes of Israel? Here's what it says. Joshua 23, 15, if you can put it up on the screen. He tells Joshua, I'm, I'm doing this for a certain purpose. I want you to take these 12 stones and I want you to build an altar. And the reason I want you to build an altar is because I want you to remind your children. I want you to remind your children, in Joshua 4, 1, sorry, that's where it's at. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests are standing and carry them over to where and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. Joshua called together the 12 men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord, your God, in the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, to serve as a sign among you in the future. When your children ask you, What do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So the Israelites did as Joshua commanded. They took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites. And the Lord had told Joshua and they carried them over them 
to the camp where they had put them down. Joshua set up the 12 stones that had been in the middle of the Jordan at the spot where the priests who had carried the Ark of the Covenant had stood, and they are there to this day. God gave them stones as a reminder of his faithfulness, of what he had accomplished. And you're to tell your children what I've done for you. You're to tell and remind your children what I've done in this moment in your life. The same command for us as parents to remind our children that God is good through Jesus Christ, that Jesus died on the cross and was raised from the dead. The same reminder that we're to pass down the scriptures to our children. The same reminder that we are to teach people around us that God has been faithful in our lives and he will continue to be faithful and he will do it again and again and again and again. And so here's my prayer for you. What fear is it that you have? Because I'm going to ask for you to come up here during this last song. And I want you to take one of these rocks. And this is from us to you for you to keep. You say, Pastor Chris, why are you giving me a rock? Because I want you to take a Sharpie on it. And I want, to write, I want you to write your fear. What fear is it that you have right now today as you walk in here? Is it money? Is your bank account running low? Is it your job or your situation? Is it your relationship? Is it your marriage? Is it your child? Is it your children? What fear is holding you and got you gripped where it's taking you to the end of your rope? And I want to tell you that God already has made a way. He's already know your fears. And he tells us to cast the fears onto Jesus. Why? Because he's already got a solution to your problem that you don't even know yet. It might be right around the corner. It might be around the block. We don't know when it's coming. But I'm telling you here that God is sovereign, that he is in control, that he has not forgotten you, and he has the, your fears in the palm of your hand. And when there is no way, he can create a way. And so I would love for you to sign your fear on this rock and just put it in your pocket. Carry it, carry it around with you at work. Put it in your pocket as a reminder of what God has done in the past, that he continues to be faithful. He's been faithful to his people in the past, and he's faithful to his children today. And let this be a reminder to you that whenever you carry that fear, whenever you have that fear, you need to cast it onto Jesus. Because he says, give me all of your fears, give me all of your anxieties, and I will give you rest. You can rest because he's already done it. You can rest because he's already accomplished it. And he already has the solution. So as we go into this last song, all you do is have to respond. He already has your solution in the palm of his hand. And so take this as a reminder the same way that the Israelites did. Write your fear on there and take it with you as a memorial to this day to remember that as we go through this series, that God has your solution already around the corner. He did it for them, he will do it again. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, Father, I pray to you and ask you this morning to help our people cast their fears onto you to help our people put their trust in you, to believe what they cannot see, and to know that you are in control and you've done it once in the past and you will continue to do it for them in the future. You have not forgotten us. For those who are, for those who have not put their trust in Jesus this morning, I wanna pray for you. You've been trying to do things on your own, just like the Israel, just like the Pharaoh's army. And you've been putting your trust in yourself and in your own possessions. And you want to cast that onto Jesus this morning. It only starts with a relationship with him. If you're saying, because the Holy Spirit's plucked, poking at you, saying, you know, I haven't been connected with Jesus in a while. I haven't given him the control of my life. I haven't given him the authority. And you need to pray. I'm telling you right now, he's already died for you. 
He already knew you were going to sin before you sinned, and he already chose to save you before you decided to come here to church this morning. He brought you here to hear the message of grace and love and salvation. He's already done the work, and all you do is have to respond. You just have to receive. Romans 10, 8, and 9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, make him the Lord of your life, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, believe what you cannot see, then you shall be saved. That's all you have to do is respond. You confess and you believe. If you'd like to do that this morning, I just want to pray for you. With every head bowed, every eye closed, You just have to repeat these words. There's nothing magical in the words. It's just a response. Father God, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I've done wrong. And I thank you for Jesus who died on the cross for my sins. And I invite you, Jesus, into my life. Take control. Renew me and make me a new creation. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.